Welcome in folks to the Resine Wellness and Interior Air Quality webinar. Rob Mountford here with you again today and I'm joined by Jeff Jelena, our Technical Services Manager. Say hello Jeffrey. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, many of you may have had contact with Jeff over the years as he's uh, across a number of uh, areas in our technical department and answers most of the queries that come in via our support lines. Jeff's a PhD in chemistry and has been uh, involved in a lot of the R&D of new products at Resine. Now we're going to turn our webcams off so you don't have to look at us. So Jeff looks like he's on the Starship Enterprise bridge there. So we'll turn our webcams off. I'm gone. I'm not. Uh, people can still see me. Yes, they can still hear you, Jeffrey, as well. <laughs> I know they can hear me, but I, okay. Oh, well, they might be able to see me and hear me. Okay, that's okay. That's all right. Yeah, these right. things happen. Yeah. Now, before we start, uh, it's been a really interesting process putting this webinar together today. I quickly realized that we are touching on some pretty big topics today around emissions, uh, health and the environment. So it's important to note that this really is a high level look at um, things very much from a paint perspective side of things. When it comes to paint and interior air quality, it really generally always comes back to VOCs. So there's a big focus on that today. And we've deviated a little bit from the topics we thought we'd cover. Um, what I came to realize very quickly as well is that when it comes to VOCs, there are a huge number of sources all around us in our daily lives, and paint really is only one small contributing factor. Hopefully what we touch on today will put VOC emissions from paint into some perspective for you, as it can often be blown out of proportion. Um, now, I would point out also that Jeff uh, is likely to butt, butt in and correct me as we go through things, as he does like to throw a few grenades. Um, if we do get a chance at the end of today, we'll answer questions, but as always, we'll come back to you directly after the webinar if we don't get that get that time. So, so right, well, let's get straight into it. So purpose of uh, today is to give you an overview of the contributing factors to interior air quality, and then really give you uh, an idea of where paint sits in the scheme of things. We're gonna have a look at obviously interior air quality. We'll have a look at exterior air quality as well. Mold resistance and antibacterial uh, products. So that's where we can help with paint products. VOCs or volatile organic compounds. Just gonna um, speak to this for, for 20 or 30 minutes. So cover a lot of what VOCs are actually about, where they are. Um, and then we're gonna have a look at who's checking on us in the industry, um, who, who are the eco, eco labels and the organizations that are that are out there promoting better and healthier um, choices and homes um, for us in our uh, communities. Uh, just while I was doing a lot, there's a, there's a huge amount of information online uh, around interior air quality. I found this document really uh, comprehensive source of info. Uh, our friends at Brands uh, put out a paper. So if you're looking for stuff, this is a good one to read. Um, there's a huge amount of other information online as well. So interior air quality. Uh, interior air is a combination of the outdoor ambient pollutants and the pollutants that are generated within the indoor environment. I know that sounds pretty uh, common sense, but often we forget about what's going on outside is quite simply just flowing inside into your house. Outside, there's some massive contributors. We're looking at vehicle emissions, uh, industrial emissions, agricultural emissions. Now that's a big one in New Zealand with methane gas uh, and other areas. Natural emissions, that's uh, White Island there. So when, when we get the emissions from that, that's out into our atmosphere. That's happening all day, every day around the planet. Combustion smoke. Fungi spores, that's one that we don't often think about. And of course, waste emissions, our landfills are, are emitting uh, pollutants into our, into our atmosphere. So indoor air, air pollutants, 
can be microbiological. So they're the, the fungi, the bacteria, the mold that we're talking about, mold and mildew, dust mites and their byproducts. The things that you breathe in, so from smoke that we've just talked about, vehicle emissions, um, cigarette smoke, that's a massive one in interior air quality. And then again, your, your, your fungi spores from your molds and mildews. Gas pollutants, of course, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and then VOCs, which we're talking a lot about today, and they're emitted from all sorts of things, from building materials, furnishings, and finishes, of course, which is where paint sits in the scheme of things. Now, I'll just sort of give you a, a general idea. Uh, when I was putting this together, um, this is not intended to scare you, but it gives you a, a good indication of where a lot of the things come from in your household. Um, and we, we are using products with VOC in them um, on a daily basis. We all do it with our cosmetics and our, our deodorants and our um, everything that goes on around the house. So I just thought I'd show this to you. Of course, we've got the outdoor ambient air uh, that we've just talked about. Then as we go around the house, uh, bathrooms, we have mould and mildew. Now that's obviously a big issue with some of our housing stock in New Zealand, and we'll talk a little bit about that nearer the end when we get into Green Building Council. Um, we all, or a lot of us grew up in houses that um, weren't well insulated and very damp in the winters, and so a lot of mould and mildew. But often in bathrooms, we've also got VOCs and other, other chemicals from personal care products and cleaning products. Um, the things that, you know, moisturizers and all sorts of things we use on skin, uh, have a lot of them have VOC in them, and certainly your cleaning products do. Laundry, same again, VOC from cleaning products. Uh, you've got molds, mildews, and other um, pathogens. Offices, now I found this a, an interesting one. Uh, VOCs and toxins from printers and electronics. So your electronics in your house are, are actually emitting things that aren't particularly great for you. Bedrooms, same again, VOCs and chemicals from personal care products. Your hairsprays are just all VOC. And nail polishes, same again, nail polish remover, all your cosmetics. Um, but one of the areas that we don't think a lot about is, is things being admitted from upholstery and furniture and carpets. And there's things like formaldehyde. Now, Jeff will talk to that in a, in a few slides time um, and just give you a general idea of what that's all about. Of course, kitchens, you get emissions from cooking, carbon dioxide, um, nitrogen dioxide, all the airborne particles from cooking. Also, we've got mold and mildew there as well. Living room, same again from your heaters, animal hair, dust, cigarette smoke, um, VOC and formaldehyde from furnishings, upholstery carpets and, and paints, dust, dust mites, and then again from your electronic uh, equipment. Living room, the, the interesting one there as well is also your air conditioning units often don't have the right kind of filters or aren't cleaned often enough, but often don't have the right kind of filters to actually filter any of this out and they're just circulating it around your house. Now, the, 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 the next one is the big one, which is just is, is one of those things that we all do on a daily basis. We park our car inside, we turn it on inside, uh, we turn it off inside and we're just pumping carbon monoxide into our house. So. Um, isn't it a crazy thing that we've got a love affair with parking our cars inside our house um, when they're designed to be outside? We also store in our garages paints and solvents and herbicides and pesticides for our gardens as well. So that gives you a general idea. That's that does that's only touching the surface. There's thousands of thousands of products around us that are emitting um, chemicals on a daily basis, and we're using them. That we're coming into contact with them. So now formaldehyde sources, Jeff is going to uh, speak to this one. What I would note though, and we'll talk a lot about environmental choice products is resin environmental choice. And, and for that matter, any environmental uh, choice paint products do not contain formaldehyde. So Jeff, you wanna jump yep. in here? Yep, uh, uh, that is correct. Um, the resin systems that we use for our waterborne coatings, if the finished paint product has the environmental choice approval. There is no formaldehyde present in that paint, and there's also no heavy metals. The majority of formaldehyde that you find within a home or within a specific room usually comes mainly from wooden materials and or uh, fabrics. In most 
wooden material such as plywood, MDF. There has been a history of using adhesives to produce the material that is then sawn up, nailed, glued in place, and that's what forms your walls um, and particularly flooring. Now, those glues used to have a high formaldehyde emission rate. And that was something that was recognized many, many decades ago. When I first joined the industry, which was <clears throat> three decades plus ago, the big buzz was formaldehyde that was coming out of chipboard that was used for flooring. So the, the issue of formaldehyde has been with us for some time. And back in those early days, uh, the paint industry responded by providing what essentially are a barrier coating that would trap the formaldehyde within the substrate and prevent the formaldehyde from ending up in the room atmosphere. Modern um, substrate uh, manufacturers are slowly but sh surely reducing formaldehyde emissions from their materials. You can now buy uh, NZ produced low formaldehyde uh, MDF and a lot of the plywoods that you now get are also have um, very, very low levels of formaldehyde emission. So now within a room, the major um, source of formaldehyde is not the paint, it's not the, the flooring uh, material, it's not the wall material, it's essentially now mostly from uh, fabrics, um, particularly furniture fabrics and often curtains. So the, the industry has moved to try and minimize formaldehyde emission because the, the issue of formaldehyde has long been um, one that has created a lot of contention. Uh, the industry that uses the most formaldehyde in this country are actually those involved in funeral homes. And there's been many studies looking at the cancer rates amongst those involved in embalming and comparing them to the general population. The general outcome is that there is no clear uh, indication that those that are exposed to formaldehyde on a regular basis actually have any higher health issues, in particular cancer rates, than the general population. That does seem surprising, but that is, um, that is generally what the conclusions are. All right, Rob, we'll yep. move on cool. to the next one. We'll carry on, thank you, Jeff. Um, you've used up a lot of your allocation there. So, um, yep. Uh, <laughs> so in, that in is theory, me. Uh, so the, some of the health issues that are caused by poor interior air quality, and the first three on this list are really obvious ones, asthma and respiratory issues. And we have, again, around our housing stock and communities, we have issues with that. Um, allergies and infections, eyes, skin, nose, throat, and irritations. They're really obvious things that we all know are occurring. The, the fourth one on there, and I've, I've separated it, is the fatigues and depression and, and those kinds of health issues that we don't see, the things that we experience, but can certainly, um, come from contributing poor interior air quality. So some of the uh, factors to poor health where paint innovation can help. So the microbiological side of things, mold and mildew, bacterial, we increase mold and antibacterial properties. Jeff will talk about that in a minute. Um, VOC levels, we're constantly, waterborne paint um, with low VOC or zero VOC, we're constantly trying to lower VOC in paint. We'll talk about why that's not always as easy as it sounds. And then the other thing for us is ensuring that we're aligned with the organizations and, and eco-labeling uh, organizations out there that are, that are focused on improving the environment and improving health comes as well. So they're the ones that are checking on us and challenging us to do better. 
So microbiological, we'll, we'll jump through this pretty quickly. So mould and bacterial growth, uh, the image there on the right is pretty brutal, but we do see a lot of that in houses. The important things here are that mould's always uh, associated with damp, low light and poorly ventilated uh, room spaces. And they do present uh, a real health risk and Jeff can jump in shortly on this one. Mm. But the main thing with mould is to eliminate it, you must alter the environment. Um, you must increase the temperatures, air movement, ventilation, and reduce the moisture. So with healthy homes, that's about your insulating the homes. That's what the, um, uh, the HomeFit programs and Green Building Council are focused on, um, is actually changing that environment. You, there are no help, paint products that you just paint on and you won't get mold again. So do you just want to jump in there, Jeff? Yep. Um, I think history has shown that the major or well, one of the major health factors associated with uh, leaky buildings was due to the presence of mold and bacteria. It's not the mold and bacteria per se that cause the problems, but it is the spores. The mold spores and bacterial spores are airborne and therefore they can be inhaled and cause the respiratory issues that um, you know, are well known in, in, in that area. So as part of painting, we have, to, we have to kill the mold or the bacteria before we put a paint on. The best chemical to kill mold is actually hypochlorite. Hypochlorite kills germs because it reacts with the proteins and the microbes. It breaks them apart. It, the process is known as denaturing. And once the protein is denatured, it cannot actually perform its job. And so we use sodium hypochlorite solutions to actually kill mold and bacteria. Now, if safety precautions are followed. Bleach is a great substance to have in a home and it is used within hospitals, in homes, um, swimming pools for instance and so it is a very impressive liquid to use to control mold and, and bacterial growth. The only issue that's really associated with it is that if you discharge um, chlorinated water, which is essentially what the moss and mold solution is, into a storm drain system, which leads directly to local streams, this can have detrimental effect on the waterway. And in fact, the hypochlorite and its byproducts are toxic to fish and other aquatic life. We have a series of products referred to as kitchen and bathroom that contain what are referred to as mold inhibitors. You must have killed the mold and killed the mold spores for these products to actually deliver the benefit. We also have an antibacterial component to the kitchen and bathroom products and they use silver, um, a form of silver. Silver is recognized and has been used for many years as a what was natural remedy for, um, for sanitizing surfaces and a lot of people use colloidal silver. They drink it, they use it on skin infections and the like. The great thing about um, silver is that it has very low toxicity to human cells, but it's very toxic to the bacterial cells. In fact, there are even common drugs that are used to treat infections that are based on silver as the, the key um, active component. So here we have the... Okay, Formaldehyde abatement. Formaldehyde abatement in New Zealand has not become an issue to the extent that it has in some other countries, particularly Asia. There is a focus now in China and Hong Kong and other parts of Asia 
to provide a means of removing formaldehyde from an indoor air and to thus improve the indoor air quality. There are a number of ways of achieving this. Um, the way that Resine has adopted is that within these products, the Space Coat Flat and Space Coat Low Sheen, there is a, a reactive component in those paints that will irreversibly bind and in effect neutralize formaldehyde. There is a limit to how much formaldehyde a paint layer can um, take up and bind, but generally the higher the film thickness, the more potential you have for formaldehyde abatement. I personally don't believe that formaldehyde abatement is now anywhere near the issue that it was three decades ago, but certainly we are still importing furniture and furnishings that will in time release formaldehyde into the indoor air um, where those particular materials are located. All right, Rob, yeah, okay. Yeah, cool, we'll crack into um, VOCs now. We're probably um, uh, five or so minutes behind, but that's okay, we'll catch up, I think, as we go, and um, yeah. Okay, so v yeah, VOCs. Why has paint become tarred with the label of VOC? Um, VOCs are volatile organic compounds. To be defined as a VOC, the material that is in those must contain carbon. So all VOCs are based on what we refer to as carbon chemistry. VOCs have unfortunately become associated with uh, toxic and dangerous substances that are harmful to health and the environment and humans. Is that label appropriate? No. Um, up until, say, the last 15, 20 years, there was a lot of solvent-borne paints made and sold into all paint markets across the globe. Those paints do contain VOCs that do have now an established and recognized um, toxicity. The common one that has disappeared from the market is um, methylene chloride based paint strippers. Methylene chloride has been shown to uh, cause cancer, and but it was a very common and very effective solvent to use for paint stripping. That has now been replaced with more environmentally friendly, human friendly paint strippers, but the downside of those is that they're not quite as effective as the as a good old VOC, uh, sorry, as a good old methylene chloride based paint strippers. So you can improve things from a health perspective, but as is with most things, there is always a trade-off. We are surrounded in our bubble by natural VOCs. You walk through a, a radiator pine forest anywhere in New Zealand, um, especially on a very hot day, and you can pick up this characteristic pine smell. Well, that is from terpenes, which are released from the trees as part of their their normal um, their normal day to day activity. The Blue Mountains. Why are these blue? Well, the reason why they're blue is that the 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 forests that covers the Blue Mountains are various species of eucalyptus. All these trees release eucalyptus oils, VOCs, and due to the quantity that is released, this gives the air its characteristic blue look 
hence the name the Blue Mountains. In recent years, and probably since the 60s, there have appeared more and more man-made VOCs. Most natural VOCs are benign and we have evolved to be essentially immune from them. However, VOCs can be released from many consumer products, cigarettes, uh, solvent-based cleaners, solvent-based paints and thinners, adhesives, glues, sealants, some wood preservatives, some air fresheners, building materials, obviously, as I've already discussed, furnishings, the good old photocopy machine, that characteristic smell as you stand over a photocopy machine is actually a VOC. There are some um, pesticides that contain um, VOCs, and there are also some drugs that um, contain VOCs. We won't go anywhere on that, that drug line. How do, how do VOCs get into um, our body? There are only two routes. One is breathing or skin contact. The breathing um, passage is the one that is probably responsible for most of the VOC um, intake that we have uh, as human beings. The effect and impact of a VOC on the body is related to the size of that body. So children um, are more likely to suffer um, toxic effects or the effects of inhaling VOCs than an adult, simply because their body size is a lot smaller. The other factor that um, operates with children is that their actual, their respiration rate is much higher than adults and so they breathe in and out a lot quicker so they can inhale VOCs to a higher quantity. Most at risk is trade painters. They are regular users of paint and the, it, they are the group that is most likely to be affected by a VOC related condition. They do have PPE equipment, but if you've heard those involved with treating you know, COVID patients, PPE equipment can be uncomfortable to use, especially if you have to wear it in hot, humid conditions. So painters would prefer to use paints that do not contain high VOC levels. The other feature with um, VOC is that it is often very difficult to pinpoint accurately that the cause of a particular health issue is due to a VOC. You've got the situation in many countries and it is the same here. If you go to your GP and complain about a particular health um, issue, some of them will ask you, what have you been doing? And you'll say, oh, I've been painting. Immediately, paint gets targeted as, as being the source. This is totally inaccurate. So what's in a can of paint? Generally, whether it is a solvent-borne paint or a waterborne paint, there is a binder. The role of the binder is to hold everything together and form a film and a film that will adhere to whatever it's applied to. There are pigments. The most obvious ones are coloured pigments. There are pigments to control gloss level. There are anti-corrosive pigments. And there are other pigments that add bulk and other features. The solvents, they're there to make the paint usable. Um, while there are 100% solid base paints, they have to be quite unique in order for you to be able to um, apply them. The drying mechanism of solvent-based and waterborne paints are quite different. With a solvent-borne paint, the solvent evaporates, 
then the end the resin components we refer to them as polymers they will become closer and closer together and then depending upon the type of paint you will get a reaction that will give you your dry paint film waterborne paint's a little bit different you can look at a waterborne paint as being an aqueous polymer ball or particle dispersed within a liquid medium. You apply the paint and as the water evaporates, the particle concentration increases, they eventually touch and start to deform. Now, in order to get a 3D network, you have to make sure that there's coalescence and poly polymer chain uh, interdiffusion. The only way to do this is to add what is called a coalescing solvent. The majority of VOCs that are present in a waterborne paint are in fact coalescent solvents. We are now moving to much higher boiling point coalescent solvents, um, but they have other downsides to, to some of the more commonly used coalescing solvents. But if you want to achieve low VOC, that is one way to do it. So the resin needs to form together. They need to contact to form the dry film structure and they need to fuse together. Why do we have waterborne paints that have VOCs? Well, the main reason is durability and performance, but also application. Waterborne paints dry very quickly. They're usually applied only as a thin, wet film, and under good drying conditions, water is rapidly lost from the paint film, and the paint film sets up. Coalescent helps keep what we call wet edge open longer, <coughs> excuse me, which allows the, the paint film to flow and level. If it dries too fast, you'll get poor film formation. Uh, you will see texture if it's rolled, and you may even see what we call tram lining due to roller marks. And the, the photo that, that Rob has got on this slide is a prime example of some of the issues that can occur when there is no or little VOC present in the paint that is being applied. While the move is more and more to lower VOC, VOC reduction, there are other effects that occur um, on the actual dried film. It not only are uh, there issues with application, but there can be issues with performance and durability. This particularly applies to exterior paint coatings. Uh, in New Zealand, we have quite a clean, um, environment and a very high UV level and the combination of UV and water is what determines how quickly a paint will um, undergo chalking which is a breakdown of the of the top surface of the paint layer so you can't just take VOC out and expect to be able to produce a paint that you can apply and will have the required performance and durability. There are slightly different um, definitions around the world as to what um, constitutes uh, a VOC. In general, as you'll see uh, later, yeah, the, the VOC is um, defined as any component of a paint that has a boiling point of less than 250 degrees C, measured at an, a pressure of 101.3 kilopascals. In the US, while this definition is used, the main focus on VOC in the US is actually the contribution of VOCs to photochemical smog production. 
If any of you have ever been to LA or Texas or some of the larger US cities, you will be very familiar with, with smog. And it occurs as a result of VOC emissions into atmosphere, mainly automobiles and um, other vehicular emissions are what causes that. The European Union, they the main definition is around organic compound boiling points, um, and they have quite specific. Um, levels of what um, a paint that is used inside can have in terms of VOC content. That has led to quite a downgrading of some of, of the coatings, but that is what the legislation is present there. In New Zealand, thankfully, we don't have to work within that particular um, legislative uh, parameters. So in New Zealand, excuse me, in New Zealand, the main definition is again around boiling points. And in New Zealand and Australia, VOCs are calculated by the paint manufacturer in accordance with the requirements of the Australian Paint Approval Scheme. So you can read on the screen what that definition is and what that requires of us as a paint manufacturer is we need to establish the VOC levels in all of the raw materials that we use to manufacture a paint coating. Once we know those levels, we can then calculate the total VOC that is present in the paint coating. This tends to lead to, to a, an overestimation of what the um, VOC level is in a paint. In other jurisdictions, particularly the US, there's been a standard uh, method used for a relatively long time called the EPA method 24 VOC determination. So what this method involves is injection of a sample of paint into what is called a gas liquid chromatograph. The GLC um, separates out the components of the paint by boiling point. In order to establish which products can be considered as VOCs and not VOCs, there is a marker put in with the sample, and that has usually has a boiling point of 251 degrees centigrade. Anything that comes off the GLC column before the marker is deemed a VOC. Anything that comes out after the marker is not a VOC. The American system has some unusual characteristics or definitions, mainly because when we're, they're talking about exterior coatings, they're talking about potential for um, smog um, to be a uh, result from use of, of the VOC. There are a lot of VOC exempt solvents in the US, um, they are now sort of moving more and more to interior air quality um, systems where they uh, use what's called um, a chamber test to establish the, the VOC. The principle of this test is to determine the specific emission rates of VOCs emitted from prepared specimens of and it can be paint or building products. The test is conducted in a small scale environmental um, chamber at specified constant conditions of temperature, relative humidity, ventilation rate and product loading factor. So what they do is they sample over time the VOCs that are being emitted from the, um, the enclosed test chamber 
and they use that to then um, come up with a definition of not only VOC levels, but also the rate of emission. That method is called up in a lot of the American um, documents that some of you may be using. The problem we have here in little old God zone is that uh, there's no laboratories in New Zealand or Australia that are set up to actually measure according to that test method. We are looking at um, seeing if, if we can interest some local laboratories in doing that, but certainly it's not something that we can do because we would not necessarily be seen as being independent. But that is possibly a way that VOC uh, statement or level declaration may well occur in the near future here in NZ and Australia. Performance and durability. Well, replacing high VOC resident technology with a more environmentally acceptable technology, it comes at a cost. Traditional resin technologies, and these may be solvent-based, <clears throat> excuse me, solvent-based or water-based, they become commodity items with many manufacturers manufacturing similar resin technologies. So because there are so many people in the market, the price has been depressed. When you come to innovative waterborne resin te uh, technologies, where we're looking at improving um, VOC reductions without compromising performance and durability, the cost of those alternative resin systems can be two or three times the cost of traditional resin technologies. So going forward, if we continue to move in the direction that we seem to be going, there will be an increase in paint cost, and this will have to be borne by the industry, mainly application. What is the future of paint? As a company, our philosophy, our formulating criteria, is that we will replace a solvent borne or high VOC paint product with a lower VOC product, ideally one that comes in under 100 grams per litre, which is the environmental choice criteria, but, and the but is, only if that lower VOC um, product has the same durability and performance of the product, the solvent-based product that it is looking to replace. Waterborne technology in terms of resins and systems for painting have really advanced in leaps and bounds in the last two decades. I believe that those advances will still continue and those advances will allow us as a paint formulator to make significant reductions in VOCs without performance or durability um, properties being affected. Will solvent born paint disappear from the New Zealand market? That's a hard question to answer. I would say not in the short to medium term. Remember, our environment is quite diverse. Uh, we have a quite definitive winter period and we have our summer period. In order to formulate one paint that can be applied under all environmental conditions is quite a challenge. The paint industry can provide um, winter grade additives, which will allow the application temperature to be dropped, but certainly that has its own pitfalls. The ideal conditions under which to apply a waterborne paint is 
10 degrees or above and humidities less than 85%. We get a number of calls from customers in Auckland complaining that over summer our paint isn't drying and we sort of ask them, well, you know, we go through the normal checklist and then one of the things we say, well, yes, it may well be close to 30 degrees, but your humidity is probably close to 90. And it is that reason that the drying rate can be effective. So there will probably always be a role for solvent-borne paint, but the ratio of waterborne to solvent-borne paint that Rosine is selling is heading towards a much higher level for waterborne paint. Some industries such as the furniture industry and the automotive industry and the industrial paint um, industry as well are still tenaciously clinging to their solvent-borne products. Uh, they allow application under a wider range of conditions. Everyone's familiar with them and they don't have some of the downsides that you'll find with waterborne paint. But it is clear that legislation, probably not New Zealand legislation, but legislation that is used in other countries will impact upon us and we will have to follow the trends from overseas uh, countries and jurisdictions. So that's essentially the end of my spiel on um, VOCs. Hopefully, I haven't been too technical. I can diverge into and that particular realm, but certainly one thing about paint. I, as I said, I've been in this industry for well over 30 years now, and I still don't know everything. There are always changes occurring. There are always challenges occurring as you move forward to try and develop more environmentally friendly uh, paint coatings. Um, those challenges are met by our R&D chemists, but there is a, a huge role for those of us that are involved in specifying those paints that we ensure that everyone that's trade and DIY applicators can apply those paints to achieve the required end result. So thank you for your time and thank I'll you, hand it back over to Rob. Thank you. Very interesting stuff there. I'm just going to cover off a few points. We've still got a little bit to go. I, we certainly won't get to questions today, but that's that's cool. We're near the end. Um, so I just wanted to, just a few points. Uh, VOCs, they're all around us and huge number of products and we're exposed to them all day, every day. We're putting them on our skins. We're, we're ingesting them and we drink a lot of alcohol, got VOC in it. Um, so there's, there's so many around us, but not all of them are nasty. Um, and if we just took VOC out of paint without viable alternatives, we, we're just going to be left with paint that just doesn't perform very well at all. Uh, and also, I'm always interested in the testing methods across the globe, and it is something, and I'll touch on it just a little bit more very shortly in a couple of slides, is that we work to uh, the Australian Paint Approval Scheme here, which is different to say, the approval scheme that's in the USA. Um, but one question I do have for you, Jeff, that just popped into my head as you were um, traveling through there, is how long does VOC take to disperse from freshly applied waterborne paint, generally? Okay, well, generally, the drying, curing, release of VOC from a waterborne paint is the result of three, um, three things temperature, airflow, and humidity. Now, if you have two of those working in your favor, you would expect that within seven days that the majority of the VOCs will have left the paint film, but unless you have that ventilation component present, they may still linger in the room atmosphere. There is a belief that a low odour paint is also low in VOC. That is incorrect. Many VOCs have little or no odour. So the odour that you're smelling is not the VOC component of the paint. There are other materials in the paint coating that may be giving you 
that um, odor. Also, human beings, we're funny creatures. If we, if our nasal system is subjected to a new odor, it will immediately react and warn us that this is something new. You have to be very careful with our olfactory system reaction that it doesn't turn you into thinking that that odor is associated with something bad. While it may be, but in most cases with low VOC waterborne paint, that is not the case. Very good. Right, we'll, we'll cover off very quickly. Um, uh, so we're doing a lot in the industry, as I talked about earlier, to um, lower VOC and, and bring in viable alternatives. But I just wanted to cover off who's checking on us out there in the industry and who are the, who are the, the advocates that are, um, are leading change. So um, we'll touch on environmental choice quickly now. Environmental Choice is the only government-owned Type 1 eco-labelling program in New Zealand, and it, this really is the big kahuna of eco-labelling here. Environmental Choice sets in place the VOC levels and raw material ingredients and exclusions uh, for products. An Environmental Choice product is always going to be a waterborne product, and it will be low or zero VOC. However, not all of them will fit into the requirements because they may have some raw materials on the exclusions list. So just a, an example, uh, of products that are waterborne and low VOC, but aren't environmental choice. So your likes of your, a lot of your two-pack waterborne epoxies and urethane, the newer ones out there, um, because they'll have, uh, they'll have an ingredient in them that, that are on the exclusions list. So things in waterborne epoxies have bisphenols in them. Um, now, environmental choice don't certify uh, organizations. So we don't just trundle on up and, and get a certificate to say we can we can put the sticker on and call ourselves environmental choice. They certify individual products and it's a really rigorous process. So I think we have to have a product in, in the market for at least 12 months before it can be approved with the environmental choice um, certificate. Um, the other paint manufacturers out there all have environmental choice products as well. So again, as I've, I've said, this really is the big kahuna of eco-labelling, particularly for paint products in New Zealand. You really don't need to go um, any further than this. There are some other really good eco-labels out there, um, but often they're really specific to the, to the program that they sit within. And, and as we've talked about, or just, just, just touched on, they quite often call for test info that's applicable to other countries' requirements and don't fall in uh, to the New Zealand and Australian guidelines or practices. So the example that we get is we get occasionally asked for uh, testing data in line with uh, South Coast air quality management system requirements. Now, South Coast being Southern California, so we're in New Zealand and we don't test to those requirements, nor do we have the laboratories, as Jeff's mentioned, to undertake those tests, so we can't provide that info. So it's it's really um, it's 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 important to note that often if you're using another an eco label, that sometimes you can um, you can um, work yourself into a corner where where we're not able to actually provide the information that you require. So just an important one to note on what actual uh, test information is being asked for. Uh, now, just so we, we do cover off our summary, that's the summary that we uh, showed you earlier. That's a statement. If you ask us for a statement about our testing, um, and that's what we provide, that shows that we, we declare it ourselves and it's done on a calculation basis. On this summary, which is easily accessible on our website, we show you the VOC levels quite clearly, um, and we also will tell you that it's an environmental, environmentally choice, uh, environmental choice, sorry, approved product. Um, and what we do also, once the products are approved, we actually stick it on our can, so it's really, really clear. You'll see that across on other um, paint manufacturers' products as well. It's very clear that that is the eco-label. So that's the eco-labeling. Now, who's out there promoting? Sorry, um, sorry Rob, the could, could I just butt in? Yep, sure. Um, I told you to yeah. butt in. <laughs> what, I, what I didn't mention is that resine colorants that we use to tint architectural paints are also um, zero VOC using the APAS definition. 
what that means is when you tint a resin base with any combination of our machine colorants, you will not change the VOC level in that particular base. Very good. Now, so as I mentioned, who's promoting better buildings and indoor air quality out there? Now, New Zealand Green Building Council, again, they're the big kahunas in this space. Um, we're proud to be corporate sponsors or corporate partners with them. Um, and they cover the Green Star and Home Star uh, programs for or ratings tools for new builds. They do have um, other uh, programs as well. And I, I'd, I'd certainly encourage you to go and have a look at their website if you're not aware of what they do. Um, Green Star is the commercial side of uh, things and it's the rating systems for design, construction and operations of the buildings and fit outs and the community. So it's a, it's a, a wide ranging scope on what they do. It covers every part of a new commercial build. Uh, interior paints included in it. And of course it's an indoor air pollutants and what a, what a New Zealand Green Building Council asking for in their Green Star program, they're looking for the big kahuna eco label environmental choice New Zealand. Homestar is the residential side and it's an independent rating tool that measures the health, warmth and efficiency of new homes in New Zealand. Now, really cool thing for Green Building Council is that Kainga Aura have just, um, have just signed to their six Homestar ratings uh, level for all their new builds. So that's a, a really cool thing for Green Building Council. Uh, again, same again, uh, same again. There, they're asking for environmental choice products um, to be used in the program. Now, we, we threw this one in uh, vegan paints. We just thought we'd cover this off. We're starting to get more and more inquiries about this, um, so I just thought I'd, I'd clear it up for you. Um, we have info. We actually even put it on our website. So there's a lot of info. Of, sorry, there's a page on there that covers it off. Because vegan requirements are around avoiding animal products and byproducts, environmental choice products again fit the bill as they have no animal products or byproducts and aren't tested on animals. Um, you do need to take care choosing so-called natural paint products out there because while they do focus on ecotoxicity levels, um, some eco-friendly natural products do contain animal byproducts and, and they wouldn't fit the the uh, vegan bill and it'd be something like a coating with beeswax in it and so it's not a vegan paint product um, so really interesting space but again as we talk about the environmental choice tick is the one that you want to be looking for we're happy to answer any questions on this stuff as well um, if you do have them in future so hopefully that clears that up for you um, that does bring us to the end today. Uh, we aren't going to have time for questions and answer, but um, I hope that you've found that very interesting. I certainly have. Putting together, it was um, uh, it was quite a quite an eye opener, and uh, we've really only scratched the surface today. So our next webinar next month will be touching on uh, common paint problems, and another area I want to cover off is paint guarantees and what they actually cover in the industry from a paint manufacturer's side of things. There's a lot of um, uh, misinformation out there or, or um, uh, misunderstanding of what a paint manufacturer's paint guarantee or warranty will cover. So we'll cover that off next time. Um, until then, uh, thanks for tuning in today and we'll catch you next time around. Thanks very much.